Have you ever wanted to lead a glorious revolution, subvert democracy in your neighboring countries, partake in high-level decision-making where a single misclick could cause half a million men to be surrounded and die? And of course, you want to do this without having to consider the ethical consequences because at the end of the day, it's just pixels. Well then, Paradox Interactive, who are sponsoring this video, have got the game for you. Hearts of Iron 4 is the premier WW2 experience and you can get the game yourself if you click the link in the description. Today we'll be playing the Soviet Union, because of course we are, but also the new DLC called No Step Back for Hoi 4 completely reworked the country, offering you the ability to play as Stalin and purge your nation of the ideologically and politically disloyal elements that are holding back your glorious collectivist revolution. You could, if you wanted to, decide to go a different route and embrace a different flavor of communism, such as Trotsky-flavored communism or goatee-flavored communism. You also have the option of reversing the revolution, restoring the monarchy, and embracing something I believe they call capitalism which I've never heard of. I personally prefer to play the game somewhat historically, so I choose to go with the centrist option. Thankfully, I have the knowledge of what actually happened in history to help me avoid some of the bigger mistakes. Having the advantage of hindsight and being able to change history is almost the entire appeal of Hearts of Iron 4 at a conceptual level. Well, that and getting screamed at by an angry Germany player over Discord because you misclicked the tanks they lent you and they all died in North Africa. I was just role-playing as Italy, I promise. That's right, this game has multiplayer and it's arguably the best and worst way to play the game. It's the best because there's nothing quite like the Hoi 4 multiplayer community. You will spend several hours of your life meticulously planning out your economy and designing not only your military equipment, but the plans that your troops will use to fight the enemy. I personally cherished watching the increasing desperation and frustration that an inexperienced USA player went through because he was on his fourth failed D-Day that essentially developed into a monumental meltdown as criticism reigned in from all sides. Because if you're losing a multi player game, someone other than you on your team has to get the blame. You will also spend several hours of your life occasionally having your game ruined because someone misclicked the focus, had to go do their homework, or simply lied about knowing how to play an important nation. Such is the nature of Hoi 4 historical multiplayer. The highs are nigh untouchable experiences to be treasured during cold Russian winters, but the lows are downright degenerate, making you question not only your own existence, but that of the people who play this game. Which is why I, in my infinite wisdom, almost exclusively play this game in single player nowadays. Because, quite simply, I don't have the time or emotional energy to try and herd a gang of edgy teenagers with the disposition of disagreeable cats into something remotely approaching the concept of teamwork. And so, with single player loaded up and the Soviet Union selected, we are assaulted with a variety of important decisions to make. My goal as Russia this game is essentially to create a wall of flesh and steel for the Axis powers to crash against. For that, I will need a few things in the early game. The first is to get an intelligence agency so I can influence the elections in my neighboring countries. This may come as a shock, but communism isn't popular outside the Soviet Union, so we'll have to use some propaganda and stage elections with guns. Our second goal will be to modify our government to emphasize free trade and upgrade our economy to a war economy. For that, we'll have to use the focus tree heading specifically for Secure the Administration, which will make changing our laws much cheaper, because in this game, how much political power or PP you have dictates how many laws and decisions you can make. By rushing for Secure the Administration, we can get a bunch of extra PP and make the PP we do have go much farther. Our third early game goal will be to make friends with Spain during the Civil War and send them lots of equipment and volunteers so we can grind a monumental amount of army and air force experience to upgrade our backward and failing military institutions. With my plan set in motion, my factory set to produce an endless amount of guns, trains, trucks and airplanes, I can finally unpause the game.
Hearts of Iron 4 in the early game is a giant simulation engine. You will make decisions and simply wait to see the consequences of those decisions for the majority of the early game, especially if you're playing as the Soviet Union. The first couple of hours will almost entirely be economic and political maneuvering. Ataturk wants to seize control over the Bosporus Strait, and I, being the Soviet Union, took that personally, and so I mobilized my entire armed forces. Attaboy, while being considered the most base Turk to have ever lived, is not insane and backs down against the glorious Soviet Union's sheer military might. The next major political event is political paranoia, because when Stalin's plans to collectivize the nation have terrible consequences, instead of backing down and reining in things, he doubles down and he will now regularly purge the government of people who thinks his policies are insane, unless we stop him. We won't stop him, because stopping him takes PP, and we need our PP elsewhere. We hold our first trial, and several people are removed from the game. However, this does mean we're right around the corner from our first goal, the secure the administration focus. We have also finally finished researching heavy fighter planes and upgrading our intelligence agency enough to start propaganda in neighboring countries. The civil war in Spain has just begun and we will offer our support completely no strings attached, of course. If by no strings attached you mean a lot of strings attached, up to and including your entire country's gold reserves and possibly even your national sovereignty. We will start by sending Spain a boatload of guns and materials that we just found lying around. Our second move will be to send them a massive group of special forces volunteers to help them fight alongside some air support. After our Lend-Lease arrives, we'll be able to send an attaché, which is important to us for two reasons. First, it gives us a portion of their army experience which we can use to upgrade our army. And second, sending an attaché gives us war support, which combined with Secure the Administration will allow us to implement war economy extremely early and extremely cheaply. War economy lets us convert military factories to civilian factories cheaper, which is already pretty cheap. So now we can begin the process of completely demilitarizing the Soviet Union, with the exception of a few factories, because we know we won't be going to war outside of a small Nordic police action. I disband my army and begin converting my military factories to civilian factories. I also begin working on sending military advisors to Spain. This is 100 free military experience over the next three years, which is just too good to pass up. In January 1937, I am close to completing the collectivization process, and the industrial capacity of the Soviet Union will know no bounds. In Spain, I have completely pushed back the fascists in the south, but my democratic puppets, I mean, friends have almost entirely failed to hold their capital in Madrid. Not good. This may be a lost cause, no matter how many guns and special forces I throw at it. Just kidding. By June 1937, I have completely fixed Spain, except for all the parts that I haven't fixed. We're also firing off our second trial purge to get rid of some traitors. Bad luck for them. Our civilian production lines are firing on all cylinders, and Mother Russia will soon be an advanced industrialized nation. We need to focus on internal stability. All of this purging has left us in a bad place economically. Gloriously, we managed to make a pocket containing the meddling Portuguese and Italian volunteers in Spain. Remember when I talked about misclicks killing thousands of men? Well, my enemy just misclicked. I closed the pocket in what can only be described as the Spanish Civil War's Battle of Cannae. Oh wait! Is that a German unit in there as well? Glory to the Soviet Union, comrade. We have crushed the fascist pigs. A few days later, Japan declares war on China, and the Germans come crawling to us for a cooperation treaty on armor technology. Thanks very much, Germany. I decide that the coup, or should I say election, in Iran wasn't happening fast enough, so I decide to engage in Middle East diplomacy. Something that has never backfired for the Soviet Union in history ever. I misclicked sending equipment to communist China and accidentally sent them my entire reserve of guns. Surely such a mistake will not come back to haunt me in the future. At the very least, we can hope our good friend Mao Zedong will put those guns to good use in spreading the message of communism. December 1937. We have finished the five-year plan and we can finally make our way towards unlocking our next research slot. Up until this point, most of my research has been spent on economic matters. However, over the next year and a half, military technology will increasingly be a priority for us. We know the Germans are coming and we need to be ready for them. 
Oh my god, I got another encirclement. It's an absolute slaughter. They're all dead. They're all gone. I Seven divisions just deleted from the face of the planet. Incredible. I decided to take strategic destruction as my air doctrine of choice because I don't have carriers and it will make my heavy fighters very good at escorting my tactical bombers to blow the fascist logistical lines to kingdom come. March 1938, we're in the end game for the Great Purge. We do lose a whole bunch of our generals, but one more focus and we won't have to deal with. Sorry have the duty of purging our government officials. We're also going to start another five-year plan. The world is about to be set on fire with war, and we need to be ready for it. Spain, by this point, has managed to take out the nationalists. Naturally, with glorious Soviet assistance, at the helm of this conflict, there would be no doubt about the outcome. That means there's just the anarchists left to deal with. And while we have no problem working with anarchists to get rid of the nationalists. This is where things get difficult. Iran is now 50% in favor of communism, which means every day that goes by, there is a chance of a coup election. Election. There's a chance of a completely non-violent election, and they will join my faction. Time well spent by the agents of communism. The fighting in Spain and China has been extremely useful for us. We have nearly 400 army experience stored up, which we can now use to improve our army doctrines. We can make it all the way down to the People's Army, which gives us the special tactic, Mass Charge. Unfortunately, it is nowhere near as powerful as the doctrine People's Eyebrow, which has been known to vaporize entire armies in a matter of seconds. Mass Charge is all about piling as many troops as possible into a single fight, and everyone takes more damage. Since we're the Soviet Union, and the main advantage we have is the sheer number of troops we can put into the field, this will serve us very well in the mid-1940s when we're counter-attacking. Our supported faction in the Spanish Civil War has succeeded in unifying the country since this was done under great supervision by our Soviet military leaders. It is only right that we also oversee the reconstruction of their country. Our volunteers have come home and every single one of them is a combat god, capable of mowing down endless waves of our enemies. And who is our next enemy, do you ask? It's Finland. September 1938, and it's time to finish the Great Purge once and for all. We have waited a long time for this day, but finally there will be no dissent in the Soviet Union, because dissent is now illegal. What's this pop-up here? You can invite someone to your faction. The Iranian Communist Authority. Incredible. It actually worked. And now we have another ally to help us in the Great Patriotic War. Salam, Persia. Welcome to the Collective. November 1938. The purge is complete and we're no longer suffering from political paranoia, which means our options are wide open. In particular, it's time to begin shifting our economy to weapon production. June 1939. Germany approaches us with an entirely reasonable diplomatic proposal. They're saying that if I accept, I'll get half of Poland, which seems like an okay deal. I accept because I need as much land as I can get between me and Germany to fill with endless Soviet manpower. In August, Germany declares war on Poland. Who could have seen that coming? Wanting to secure Leningrad, I begin justifying a war on Finland. I read my newspaper on September the 11th, telling me that Warsaw has fallen to the Germans, only a day later to get the news that it has been liberated. I have the printmaster at the local newspaper sent to Siberia. Printing sensationalist daily updates is a new crime that I won't tolerate. Poland has fallen. Germany sends me half the country as they promised, and I immediately begin constructing an endless supply of military factories. Now that we have a border with Germany, it's time to start mass producing rifles and uniforms. We have to fill every inch of this country to the brim with gherkins. We finish justifying war on Finland, and then we declare. We don't really need much to beat them, but what we want is to grind some more army experience off of them. We also design the general purpose infantry template we're going to be using for the war. 15 divisions of infantry with support artillery, support anti-tank, and anti-aircraft guns with a side order of recon and engineers. This is our elite division template. Our second division template is a simple meat wall with anti-aircraft guns. We won't have air superiority early in the war, so AA guns will be a necessity. I make an entirely reasonable demand to annex the Baltic countries, and then I finish up the police action with Finland. 
I now have enough experience to put together my armies and I need to rest and build up. I demand even more land from Romania as well. Every inch of this land will be fought over. Finally, Iraq has joined the common turn. Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan will be soon to follow and I've sent agents to Mexico. We have to finally deal with Trotsky. We set off a raid to assassinate him, but he survives the attempt. I suppose we'll try doing it the quiet way. December 17th, 1940. Germany cancels the non-aggression pact. This is where it begins. I already have a wall of flesh and steel ready for them to tire themselves out against. I spent some time building factories in Spain so I could lower their autonomy. I'll need their help at a critical moment. They will most likely die at the hand of the Germans, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. They just need to hold on long enough for the Allies to land troops on Gibraltar. July 10th, 1941. Germany declares war on me. Everything we have done has built up to this moment. Our five-year plan is disrupted and the battle begins. I immediately call all of my faction members to war, except for Spain, and dissolve all of my fallback plans, except a slightly modified Stalin line. We manage to kill Trotsky in Mexico, and I retask all of my agents to spying on Germany. We already have all the faction members we can reasonably get. Not long later, I notice that I'm actually managing to hold back the fascists and I urge all of my forces to the front line immediately. We might not have to fall back as far as I had thought initially. In December, my manpower dips impossibly low, even hitting zero sometimes. But I've just unlocked the most important part of my army doctrine. Not only will this make the effective combat width of all of my infantry divisions smaller, so more infantry can partake in a fight, it will also increase my recruitable population by 5%, which will easily take care of the fact that I have low manpower. When you combine this really small infantry combat with, with the mass charge tactic, infantry becomes a terrifying force on the battlefield because you can fit almost six, seven, maybe 10 full strength infantry divisions in a single fight where normally any other country could fit three or four. And that's exactly how I plan to do my counterattack. I'm starting to gain air superiority and I'm now reinforcing and rebuilding the latest in Soviet infantry equipment. And once I have a sufficient amount of this infantry equipment, I'll be able to actually push back the Germans. Thankfully, winter has come to my aid. Almost no attacks are being launched against me. And that's partially because I started bombing their trains and they're having trouble getting supplies through to the front line. The Italians mount a failed invasion of Crimea and are very easily pushed back. This is just par for the course of the Italians in World War II. They were basically useless, let's be real. I wanted to tell a story about World War II and it's about Italy being bad. March 1942, the front line is almost completely silent. Only a sporadic attack here or there that fails almost instantaneously. The Germans have spread themselves too thin, and so now it's time to call Spain into the war. They will almost certainly die to the uh, German offensive, but that's not what their goal is. Their goal is to pull as many of the troops from the front line as possible, and when they eventually surrender, provide an avenue for the Allies to invade into Europe. Because the completely incompetent Allies lost the entirety of Africa, because they're just useless at it. I'm joking, they're not completely useless, they just, you know, sometimes they panic and they, they drop the ball. I mean, the Germans alone have lost almost two million men just to me. The Italians have lost nearly half a million and pretty much everyone else has just lost insane numbers of troops when I've only lost just shy of a million on the defense. I think it's safe to say that this is going really well for me, especially because now I've completely finished my doctrines. Uh, somehow, to my amazement, uh, Mongolia... <laughs> <laughs> and Iran have troops in Spain and they're actually holding. Um, I, this, I, I, I don't know, like my role play has broken down because Spain is supposed to lose. I don't know what these guys are doing. Like let, let the Germans win. It's part of our strategy. In May, the enemy troops look run ragged. And so I decide to begin the very first counter offensive of the war. The entire front line lights up with battles and uh, we slowly start pushing them back. The Spanish distraction looks like it worked perfectly and the enemy won't be able to hold against the absolutely ridiculous wave of human troops that I'm throwing at them. I currently have about 4 million men on the on this border alone and uh, pretty much every single one of them has just been told to uh, attack the enemy. Oh man, just look at that beautiful front line moving forward. This is why you play Hearts of Iron 4, okay? I hope I've explained it adequately. Is, is you get You get to like you get to do this. You get to like come up with a plan. You got to figure it out. Okay, this is what we're going to do. And then you execute the plan. And then you got to watch this little border just move so satisfyingly since we've outmaneuvered the uh, the Germans. 
and the Hungarians and all the Italians and everyone, everyone who is in the alliance against me, which is pretty much the entire continent at this point versus me. Like, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be a little bit disappointed if I don't get to see a D-Day. Like, the whole roleplay thing has kind of broken here. If I actually, like, kill the, the Germans right now. Like, uh, where is D-Day? I know it's, like, two years early for it. Actually, it looks like we're starting to get bogged down and slow down because we're running out of guns. <laughs> oh, God. Let's just, not, let's just not look at the deficit screen. i got to keep this offensive up up until uh, September or so. And then I might slow it down. My supply lines are becoming incredibly stretched thin. And the enemy resistance is getting tougher as the front line gets narrower. August 1942, I tell the troops to stop advancing and to rest for the winter. We have to dig in, lick our wounds, and wait for the Allies to do actually, literally anything to help me here. Because, my god. I decide to continue the attack in October, because we've already resupplied almost our entire army. And uh, things are going quite well. We are bashing up against the Carpathian Mountains here. But otherwise... We're slowly but surely pushing them back. I think they're starting to run out of manpower and they can't get their troops to the front line fast enough. Oh, that's huge. We managed to capitulate Romania. It's over. Romania, that's it. The first of the Titans have fallen. Quickly, advance in. We have to break that line. I think that's all she wrote for the Axis. <clears throat> There's not much left of them right now. Uh, it's a little bit sad because I didn't even get to unlock my uh, super modern tanks. My faction also managed to completely break Italy in North Africa and Egypt. We're swiftly advancing towards Vichy's France holdings, as well as down south through Africa itself. I gotta say, this is a game you could be proud of. I'm, I'm very happy with how this has gone because we've just managed to take Berlin. You can see the German troops are just constantly falling back under the literally relentless wave of Soviet troops. Like, this is what every single battle looks like. Four or five Soviet divisions to a single half-strength German or Italian division. They're just completely broken. They can't hold me back anymore. And all I did was make mountains and mountains of infantry, heavy fighters, and tactical bombers. It's December 1942. Hungary will soon fall. Bulgaria is on the brink of destruction. Spain is... I don't even know how Spain is holding. I, it's miraculous. All my little uh, friends in the common turn just piled in troops here. It's hilarious and amazing as well. February 1943, I begin my... What I hope is my final push. I hope that this is the push that ends the game. The Germans are crumbling in Western Germany. The Hungarians are falling apart. And the Bulgarians are surprisingly holding quite well. But... I do have enough troops to break through their lines in some places. Greater Hungary capitulated. I get all of their equipment. It does mess up my front line a little bit. But that's one less army on the front line that I have to deal with. Miraculously, Spain still holds. I'm so glad that I managed to puppet Spain. This is actually huge for me. Is how much work Spain has done for me this game just by existing. Bulgaria has capitulated. Another head of the Hydra has been cut off. And we finally have unlocked the modern tank chassis, which is what I had planned originally to, uh, to use to actually break this war. And take a moment to show you guys some of the cool features of the, uh, of the new DLC where you can design your own tanks. I was going to be like the big end game thing I did was make some really cool tank divisions, um, but apparently infantry just wins. I don't have all the tank technology, but I have made a really, really superb tank here. Uh, it's got 150 armor, which is absurd, considering its gun can pierce 170. In order to actually crack this tank open, you need a tank of equal tech level. Uh, that's because I gave it sloped armor, cast armor, gave it interleaved road wheels. It's got an auto loader. It's got a, a stabilizer. And now when I save this tank, I can come in here and start producing it in my factories, which is, again, how I had planned to win this game. I was going to just stack... A million factories onto tanks. There it is, boys and girls. The German Reich has capitulated without a single spot of help from the Allies. Not even a D-Day in sight, okay? The closest thing they had to a D-Day is they power dropped some troops into, into, into Hungary. whoop de doo Where Where was your D-Day? I had like an entire... <laughs> I had like an entire narrative built up for this whole campaign. I was going to be like, oh yeah, cool. We finally, the moment of victory is at hand. We have finally beaten back the enemy. And then uh, they, just, they just kind of fell over like a house of cards. But that's part of the fun of Hearts of Iron 4. It, it, it subverts your expectations. It 
is a canvas that you can paint your own idea of history uh, onto history. And there's a little bit of railroading. Things are some things are like set in stone. You can't change them. But there's a lot you can change. And, and that's where the fun comes from. But you could do this. <clears throat> One of the more satisfying things you can do is zoom out after a successful campaign and just see the fact that the Soviet Union just like owns the entirety of Europe. Um, although the war, the peace conference hasn't happened yet. Italy is on the verge of defeat. And considering I almost single-handedly uh, won this war, I'll be making a lot of demands <laughs> of the capitulated enemies, the Allies be damned. I don't think there's enough tungsten in the world to, like, fuel my modern tank factories. Yeah, they're currently demanding <laughs> 500 tungsten. <laughs> oh my god. I'm making nine modern tanks a day. Just keep in mind, one of these modern tanks probably costs, like, a couple of million Um couple million dollars to build and I'm making nine of them a day. Italy will peace out any moment now I'm hoping because they're on. Yep there it is. Okay so I single-handedly won this war on my own. I'm gonna take a lot of stuff. All right Poland? Nope. This is potato land now. All of this. I'm not even releasing it as a puppet. I'm taking it directly. If the UK or the USA has a problem with that you know what? They can just have a problem with that. Uh, that's what I can eat in the first bite. The very first bite of Europe. Nom. Oh! <laughs> I'm taking another bite out of Europe here. Welcome to the Soviet Union, comrade. Oh, warm water ports? The Netherlands? Oh, these independent nations that I never... I have no right to control? Thank you very much. I'll have them all. Oh, yeah, I'd like some military bases in the Mediterranean as well. Absolutely. Oh, North Africa too? Oh my god, this is just free. It's free real estate. I'm just yoinking my way around the world. I've just taken huge... It's all mine. I've taken everything. There's very little left. I could maybe take a few bites out of Vichy France, but uh, that's it. The war is over. I don't care about the war with Japan. That's America and the UK's problem. Everything that is red is the common turn. Look at this. This is this is the dark vision of the future that could have happened. And if you want to do something like this yourself, go ahead to the description of the video. Grab yourself Hearts of Iron 4. Pick a country and have a great time. Check out the new DLC. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I love you all very much. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.